Thanks, everybody. You can be seated. Thanks for having a hymn in there. I love coming up following a hymn. Welcome, Davis. Glad to have you part of our church family. And good morning, everybody. Glad you are here with us on this soggy Mother's Day, but I don't know. I think maybe that's a little bit what motherhood is like sometimes, right? You, you get the sunny days and you get the kind of the nasty days, right? So but we're glad you're here. Uh, if you wouldn't mind opening up your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy, and we're going to be in chapter 2. And we are going to be looking at verses 1 through 7 today. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. And as you're turning there, just for sake of review, we are in a series that we're calling Unstoppable. We're talking about the unstoppable God and we as Christians living the unstoppable life. And, and this is a book, a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, his young student, his young protege, his Padawan learner, um, those of you in the Star Wars. Um, and it's a deeply personal letter here. It's Paul writing near the end of his life while he's in jail, nearing his execution, writing to Timothy, his friend, his son in the faith, who is a pastor of a church who's in a real difficult situation. So not only is Timothy knowing he's about to lose his mentor, his friend, his father in the faith, but he's dealing with a church where there's a lot of things that have crept up, some false teachers, some, some disputes, certainly some persecution in other ways. And Paul is writing to him saying, don't give up. You can do this. You have resources. You know who you are. You have a job to do. So keep that purpose clear and be unstoppable. So as we look at chapter two, hopefully we're going to have a little bit of fun. I don't know about you. You know, everybody has different styles, different ways of learning. Some people, you know, they like to read. Some people like to have it shown to them in different ways. Other people like kinetic learning where you actually get involved in doing some things. So today, I, I'm going to try a little bit of the kinetic stuff, okay? Which means you're all going to have to get involved in one way or another. So... And we're going to start this off first. I have a job, Joy Jobson. I've asked to do something for me today. So, and, and in some ways, you have permission. You don't have to listen to me while you do your job, okay? Same. So, and, and while she's doing her job, you don't have to really worry about her. But if she comes up to you, don't, don't be, don't be afraid. You know, she's, she's, she's a friendly person, right? So, so, Joey, go ahead and do what, you, what I asked you to do. I'm, I'm going to see what time it is. When you get done, just shout out, let me know, and, and make your grandparents to be the very last ones. Okay. So, I know, now you're all like, what's going on? And, you know, am I going to be so distracted by this that it's okay. We'll get you involved a little bit later. So, um, all right, before we get into chapter two, just want to, again, for a sake of review and reminder, in, in chapter one, Paul was giving Timothy his very first charge in this, uh, and part of it was, don't be ashamed, expect persecution, expect suffering, but at the heart of it all, you, you have the gospel, and because you have the gospel, you can do it, you can be unstoppable, you don't need to be ashamed. And so that's going to bring us here to chapter 2. So before we do that, why don't I pray, and then we will uh, jump in. Okay. And when I say jump in, we, there might be some literal jumping at some point, okay? So pray with me. Okay, maybe not. 
Our Father God, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you have given us this church family to, to grow together, to learn together, uh, and to work together to, to come hard after you. Uh, and I pray that today as we open up your word that you will speak to us, that you will help us to see the truth of your words with new insight. Um, but even more than that, not because of something new, but I pray that we will take your word and we will apply it to our lives so that you can use us for your great namesake and for your glory. So God, may my words be your words. And may all else be forgotten. So we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so are you there? It's 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start in verses 1 through 7. And let's see what this will look like as I move forward. Oh, it helps to turn it on. There we go. Well, let me read this first. Chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying. For the Lord will give you insight into all of this. So the first thing that Paul is doing here in this passage is he's reminding Timothy that he needs to focus on his job. And there are two things in this that he says. In verse 1, he says, remember where your strength comes from. And then in verse 2, he says, remember what your job is. So in light of everything that is going on with Timothy and with the church there, Paul calls Timothy back to the main thing. He's telling Timothy, keep in front of you what the main thing is. See, you realize that everybody has an agenda for you. There are lots of hot topics out there that can put us off course from what we are called to do. But we as a church need to remember what our main thing is. So whether it's right to life and eliminating abortion, or whether it's ending human trafficking, or whether it's caring for the homeless and the poor, or whether it's social and biblical justice, all of these things are important. And certainly we as Christians need to speak into those truths and other issues, but they are not the main thing. Enjoy, you done? All right, good, thank you. That took you about five minutes. Now, did, every, did everybody hear Joy tell them that Jesus loves them? Everybody, right? Everybody got that? Good. So that took one person five minutes to tell, I don't know what, about 100, 120 people that Jesus loves them. All right, so keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you, Joy. So again, Paul's saying, focus on the main thing. Remember where your strength comes from. So there in, in verse 1, the way that this verse reads, and, and to me, it, it, it kind of reads like a command, right? You then, be strong. You, Timothy, be strong. But I think it really is much more gentle than that. You know, when I, when I hear it, I kind of think of when I hear people tell me to have a nice day. When I say nice day. Because usually my first thought is, are you telling me I need to have a nice day? Like, am I required to have a nice day? 
Um, better yet, it actually reminds me a little bit of the, the conversation between Bilbo Baggins and Gandalf in The Hobbit. And if you're not familiar with that, that little section from the book or the movie, Bilbo says, good morning, and he meant it. The sun was shining and the grass was very green, but Gandalf looked at him from under long, bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean, he said. Do you wish me a good morning or mean that it's a good morning whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning? Or that it is a morning to be good on? And of course, Bilbo said, well, all of them at once. So when we read verse 1, it says, you be strong. And so how do we hear that? I mean, certainly it is a command. He needs to be strong. He needs to be trusting in the Lord. But I think in light of the context, in the light of what he's saying, Timothy is to be encouraged that not only does he need to be strong, but that he actually can be strong. That he can draw his strength by the grace he has in Christ Jesus. He gets his strength from the grace. He can be strong because he has grace. God's hand is upon Timothy. And God's hand is upon each of us who know Jesus. You know, we know that grace is a gift, it's something that we get that we don't deserve. And in chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Paul has reminded Timothy to, flan into fl to flame, fan into flame the gift of God that is in him. Because God did not give him the spirit of timidity, but he gave him a spirit of power and of love, and of self-discipline. So what he's saying here is, as you remember where your strength comes from, remember that you have resources. You don't need to fall into fetal position and worry about whether or not you can do what God has called you to do. You have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And just as the Holy Spirit was in Timothy, the Holy Spirit is in each of us who know Jesus Christ. And so remember, no, no matter what, you have strength to focus on the job. But then he goes on to follow it up with, remember what the job is. Now I'll say this, this is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Um, it is the motivation behind the reason I chose to come on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ 27 years ago. Um, it was probably one of the very first verses that I learned. In fact, when my wife and I were living in Illinois where vanity plates are free, I put 2 Timothy 2.2 on my license plate. So, although I would often get people who were semi-biblical literate, say, oh, 2 Timothy 20, what does 2 Timothy 22 say? And in my younger, more snarky days, I would say something like, well, it probably says you should read your Bible because there is not, a 2 Timothy 22 doesn't exist. So I wouldn't be that snarky now. I might think it, but I wouldn't say it. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, anyway, I love this verse. Um, It says, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Timothy's job was to take what he has learned and to pass it on. But it's really so much more than just passing it on from one person to another person. There is depth, and there is wisdom, and there's strategy in Paul's words here. Now, bef before we actually look at what this job is that he's calling him to do, let's, I want to pause just for a second and look at 
what exactly Timothy is supposed to pass on. Because the verse starts out by saying, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. So what exactly did Paul say to Timothy? Well, actually, we, we don't have enough time to say all that, but Paul traveled with Timothy, or Timothy traveled with Paul on Paul's second missionary journey. So he heard a lot of the things that Paul had to say. In fact, you can read about it in Acts 16 through 18, where Timothy is on this journey with Paul. But Paul was also with Timothy when he wrote the book of Philippians. If you look at the end of the book of Romans, you see that Timothy was with Paul when he wrote the book of Romans as well. Paul and Timothy and Silas were together when, they re- when Paul wrote the letter to the Thessalonian church, actually both letters to the Thessalonian church. And so on all those things, Romans, Philippians, First and Second Thessalonians, and even Timothy was in Corinth when they received a letter from Paul. So all these books, all these letters that we have from Paul were things that Timothy heard Paul say. And so what are, what are some of those things? It talks about the consequences of sin, right, in Romans 3 and Romans 6. That salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. That nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. That we should have the mind and the attitude that Jesus had. Timothy heard about Paul talking, writing about the second coming of Jesus. And that there's hope and that there's a future. And then certainly Timothy heard Paul talk about that he needs to stand firm in the midst of persecution and suffering. These are the truths that Timothy was supposed to pass on. In essence, Timothy's supposed to be passing on the gospel. Teaching the gospel to another generation so that that generation tells the next generation, and so on and so on and so on. You know, it's interesting to me that the church has been really good about passing on certain traditions and, and, and legalistic dogma. You know, the, the church that I grew up in, I heard an awful lot about you're not supposed to drink and you're not supposed to smoke and you're not supposed to go to the movies or play cards because all those things were bad. It may not be the best, but that's the things that we kind of focused on. And I think if you don't do these things, then, you know, you're in pretty good standing with the church, which seems a little odd because the Bible doesn't talk about a whole lot of those things specifically it talks a lot more about grace and forgiveness and so many other things that I heard very little of in the church. You know, so we are, we're really good as a church to pass on traditions and, and other kind of dogma, but we don't do such a great job teaching people why and how to live the Christian life. Or even what our job is, why we are called to be Christians in this world. But as I said before, this verse, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, is more than just passing on something from one person to another. As if it was Timothy's job to only share the gospel with as many people as he could. Paul is saying, this is what you need to focus on. Invest yourself into the lives of other people. And help them so that they will in turn invest in other people too. That call, that job for Timothy 
is the same job that you and I have today. It is to invest into other people so that they will invest in other people. And the reality is no event, no teaching, no anything else should ever get us off course from this job. Paul is saying, this is your assignment. And should you choose to accept it, take the gospel and find faithful people to teach it to. This is how you're supposed to leverage your life. And what is so good and what is so deep and so strategic about it, it's not just spiritual addition, like joy telling each individual person that Jesus loves them. That's one person telling another person telling another. That's spiritual addition. This is spiritual multiplication. This is Paul telling Timothy. Now now watch this. Notice how many generations are involved in this. You get Paul, the first generation, telling Timothy, the second generation. And Timothy is supposed to find faithful men who will then tell others. There are four generations of this in this. There's Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful men, and faithful men to others. How many of us have those kind of generations in our life? How many of us have a Paul that has been pouring into our life? And if you have that, you are certainly a lucky person, a very fortunate person, to have somebody who's able to invest in you. But there are so many of us who have been sitting into the pews of the church for five or 10 or 40 years who have never taken it to the next level, have never gone from hearing it from somebody else and then passing it on to another faithful person. And we wonder why the church is dying out and losing its influence in our culture today. You know, if, if we were to spend our life telling people about Jesus, if we told 100 people about Jesus every day, in the first year, we would still only tell 36,000 people about Jesus, which is a lot. I, I, don't, I, I haven't told 36,000 people about Jesus. After four years, we might be able to tell the entire city of Dayton about Jesus if we told 100 people a day. After 16 years, though, you'd still only have a little more than a half a million people that you'd told. So meaning after 32 years, you would have told just a little bit more than a million people. So about the Miami Valley in in 32 years. But in spiritual multiplication, if you tell one person and only share your faith with one person a year, and you spend that year investing in them, teaching them, training them so that they know how to share their faith. And then that next year, you each tell somebody about Jesus and invest in them and train them and teach them how to share their faith so that in the third year, there's four of you going out telling that. It may not look like much after the first few years. But in less than 30 years, well, less than 31 years, you could have reached the entire world, seven point whatever billion people for Christ. 
That's if you're just sharing your faith with one person a year and investing in them. How much more effective and strategic is that than getting one professional Christian to share Christ with 100 person, 100 people each day? But we're not doing it. That's not what we as a church are doing. All right, so that's heavy. But this is what we're called to do. But I want to, uh, I, I want us to get involved and see how this works, right? So, all right. I was told that when somebody saw my PowerPoint and they saw that there was a Wayne's World clip on here that they knew I must have been preaching. So, so what I want us to do, I want us to get involved and see how this works. So, because if you remember a few minutes ago, Joy went around and told all 120 people that Jesus loves them. And it took her five minutes to tell that many people that Jesus loves them which I think is still pretty good. But we want to do this idea of spiritual multiplication. I want us to actually engage in it. Okay. So, and it looks like this. Okay, this is what it looks like. Well, you know how these things start. One guy tells another guy something, and then he tells two friends, and they tell two friends, and they tell their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. on. You know how these things go. All right, did you get that? All right, did you get that? All right, can we play it one more time? Can you go back a slide and play it one more time? It's only 12 seconds, so I think it's okay. And plus, I like Wayne's World. Well, you know how these things start. One guy tells another guy something, and then he tells two friends, and they tell two friends, and they tell their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. You okay. Know how these things go. So this is what I want us to do. I want Joy to get up again, and I want her to tell somebody that Jesus loves them. And when, and I'm going to assume you're going to tell your sister. So Natalie, when she tells you that Jesus loves you, I want you to stand up, and I want you to tell at least two people that Jesus loves them. And then when somebody tells you that Jesus loves you, I want you to stand up and go and tell at least two people that Jesus loves them. And if they're already standing, that's okay. But I want to see how long it takes us to get from this side of the room to the grandparents on this side of the room. How long will it take if we were to all get involved in telling people that Jesus loves them, okay? All right, so Joy, you ready? Okay, on your mark. Get set. Go. Now, Joy, you have to keep going, too. So if you've been told, stand up and tell other people. Now, if you don't want to do this, like, if you're, like, you're a little cautious of people, go ahead and stand up right now and, and... Now go tell people. So right now we're at uh, 30 seconds. Thank you. All right, do we have everybody? All right, very good. All right, you can go back to your seats. Thank you, thank you. I know for some people standing at what? Standing up on a Sunday morning, getting around doing something? So unheard of. All right, that took 52 seconds. And that's assume I actually stopped when the last person heard. 52 seconds to go from one side of the room to the other when everybody got involved. That is spiritual multiplication. That is what it should look like in telling people about Jesus, people. It shouldn't be the professional Christian telling 100 people a day, they're never going to get to the task at hand. 
There is a lost and dying world out there. And yet some of us have our bottoms stuck to our chairs in the church. And I'll say this too, I will confess, even though I've been on staff with Campus Crusade for 27 years, I haven't done a great job of finding one person and discipling them each and every year so that they know it. I've led a lot of people to Christ. And I'm not sure what, how good of a job I've done in training them so that they can tell that next generation. But you know what? Those of us who are parents, moms on this our Mother's Day, we have generations that live in our house. And even if they're not still living in our house, we have generations of people. That even if they're not open and receptive to the gospel at this moment, these are people that we can pour our lives into. This is the job that Paul is reminding Timothy of, is to not lose sight of this. <clears throat> so why is this important? A State University of New York study said that for most immigrants that had come to the United States, that they will have lost the ability to lose, to speak their native language by the third generation here in the States. And the same is true for, our, for the church. You know, earlier this week on a Breakpoint podcast, it said that 50% of American Christians think that it's, always morally acceptable to have sex before marriage. 50% of American Christians would say that. Nearly half of evangelical Protestants said that they would or intend to live with a person of the opposite sex that they're not married to. And now those are just two simple factors, but the American church at large, and often in the Christian family in general, we have not done a good job of what they said in the break point podcast of catechizing our next generation. We haven't done a great job of teaching our young people what it is we believe and why we believe it. We haven't done a great job of instilling our faith into the next generation so that they will live it out and pass it on to their kids and grandkids. We've somehow bought into this, well, a person's faith is their own individual thing, and they can figure it out on their own. They're not figuring it out on their own. They're going to the internet, and they're going to other places, and they're looking for truth in places that it doesn't exist. And we, I, need to do a better job of that. This is what Timothy is called to do. This is what we are called to do. We are called to multiply ourselves in the future generations. Okay. So the next thing that Paul calls them to do, excuse me, is Paul says not only do you need to focus on your job, but you need to finish the job. Multiplication is not easy. 
It was easy in this room, right? But multiplication is not easy, and the enemy is going to push back on us. And so Paul gives Timothy three analogies here of what it's like to be focused on the job. The first one is that of a soldier. The second is that of an athlete. And the third is that of a farmer. So the first analogy as a soldier says, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Paul says, you have your marching orders. They have been assigned to you. You don't get to choose. As a soldier, you have to remember, you're going to face hardship. You're going to face difficulties. You're going to be shot at. You might think that you signed up to be a hero, or you might think that you signed up to travel the world or to get an education or whatever other motivation there may be to joining the military. But what you really signed up for was to go to war. So don't be distracted, soldier. You are a soldier, so don't concern yourself with the things that those civilians are doing. All the benefits will come later. But you have one job, and your job is to please the one who enlisted you. Your job is to please your commanding officer. And as Christians, we are in the Lord's army. It reminds me of that little song we used to sing in, the, in Sunday school. I may never march in the infantry, ride in the cavalry, shoot the... You guys know that song? I may never fly or the enemy, but I'm in the Lord's army. Thank you. As Christians, we are in the Lord's army. And we have one job, and that is to please Jesus. He is our commanding officer. You might have been drawn to Christ thinking that, gosh, I'm I'm looking forward to heaven and this is my ticket in. And yes, that's a part of it. But that comes later. You might have come to Christ thinking, gosh, I can be a part of a church family. I might have a sense of belonging and purpose. And yes, that is true. But you are in the Lord's army. And our commanding officer has called us to serve. And we shouldn't be distracted by our jobs or our hobbies or anything else that this world has to offer. We are called to serve the Lord, to go and make disciples And guess what? As Christians, there will be hardships. Hardships for the cause of Christ. We will be shot at, metaphorically speaking, as Christians. But the cause of Christ will not be advanced by distracted Christians. On the battlefield, a distracted soldier is a dead soldier. And in the Christian life, a distracted Christian is an ineffective Christian. So Paul says, remember what you signed up for. You are a soldier, and your job is to serve Christ. The second analogy he uses is an athlete. And the point of being an athlete is that rules matter. Paul says, don't be disqualified. Bring your body under subjection to the rules of the game. So similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. We as Christians don't have the prerogative to make our own rules. We do what is required by the rules if we want to win. Well, reality is our life is not our own. 
We are slaves to Christ. We are servants of Christ. And this isn't just good advice that we can wink at or nod at affirmingly and just go on with our day. As an athlete, we are here to follow the rules. And they are to be believed and to be obeyed. You know, we talk about this a lot here at EBC. That we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, that, that's our slogan. To honor God and to love people and to a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what's known as the great commandment. It's not the great suggestion. But playing by the rules requires focus. We don't live by our feelings. Our feelings can come and they can go. Our feelings will deceive us in lots of different ways. But we as believers need to put our faith in God's word alone. Nothing else is worth our believing. So the rules matter. We are there as soldiers to please our commanding officer as Athletes, we are there to follow the rules and do what he's called us to do. But there's, there's a good thing at the end. Because the third analogy is that as a farmer. It says the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. The good thing is at the end, there is a reward. You know, the farmer doesn't plant and then the very next day gets some fruit out of the ground or some crops out of the ground. Or it doesn't work that way. It's the hardworking farmer who puts in the time to till the soil, to pull the weeds, to, to do everything that he needs to do in order to produce that crop. And once he's put in the hard work, the reward comes at the end of the season. The crop is coming in. And when it does, you'll get your share. This isn't a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. This is, this is not your best life now. This is do what he's called us to do. There are going to be days of hardship and rain and, and junk And this life may look awful. But in the end, just like with the hardworking farmer, there is a reward. And that reward may not be here on this earth. But there is something more glorious waiting for us in heaven. And those who are faithful the ones who will enjoy it the most. And we've heard it say, said that there's no pain, no gain, right? Well, in the Christian life, the pain sometimes comes from saying no to self. The Christian life, we need to learn to say no to our own impulses, to our desires to our own appetites. And we learn to say yes to Jesus above all else. So in this section, Paul says, focus on your job. You have strength. You have a job to do. And then he says, finish the job and finish it well. Work hard. Remember the rules. But then Paul closes with this. He says, reflect on what I'm saying. 
And I heard it said earlier this week on this very verse, Paul saying, don't waste the wisdom I'm giving you. Think about it. Take it seriously. Think about how it applies for your life. Stay after it. Be unstoppable in these things. Because God will give you understanding of what to do and how to do it. He'll make it clear. He will provide a way. And this is my prayer for us. This is my prayer for me. That we as a church would remember what our job is. And that we would go after it. Because people need to hear about Jesus. And it's not going to happen with just one person doing it. We all need to be involved. And we all have the resources to do it. There are lots of different things that keep us from, from going about this. We might feel like, I don't know how to tell somebody about Jesus. Or we might have fears. We may not all be as bubbly and easygoing as Joy Jobson to be able to tell people that Jesus loves them. We might feel that we are somehow disqualified in this. Don't believe those lies. As a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit living within you. You have the same power living in you that was the power that raised Christ from the dead. You can have an impact on other people's lives. And I pray that we as a church would go about that mission full heart. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this job that you have called us to do. And I pray that each and every one of us would be full, head on into this ministry of spiritual multiplication, of pouring into the lives of other people. And I know it's hard. We're discouraged at times. We focus on ourselves. We look internally rather than looking to you. So I thank you that we have your spirit living within us, empowering us to live this Christian life each and every day. And so God, use us as individuals and use us as a church to make your great name known. I pray this in Christ's name.